Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. I don't know if you guys get bored with some of these hunts that I'm actually showing where I'm rattling, you know, next cornfields. But uh, I did that tonight. And uh, I was on public land and I rattled four bucks out of the standing corn. Um, one was a pretty nice one, but I did not get a shot. I'll show you because I videoed him for a second and then I pung the camera up and grabbed my bow, but I didn't get a shot. He was just stayed a little bit too far out of range. But I rattled him in and I also rattled in another buck prior to him coming in. The first one I rattled in out of the corn was a two-year-old. He had a relatively wide rack, probably a 15 inch inside spread, but his points were very, very short. It was a six point, um, typical Michigan buck, you know, a two year old probably scored 70 inches. And what was really interesting is when I came into the location, I walked through the corn, like 10 rows out. But when he came out of the corn, he cut my tracks. Okay, I wear scent lock and I have clean rubber boots on and if a deer smells in Michigan if a two-year-old buck smells human odor they are gone they do not keep coming usually this happens uh, I'd say two three four times a year where a buck will cut my route and actually smell ground disruption and where my pants may have rubbed against vegetation but they definitely smell a ground disruption where when I, every time I step my foot down, I'm breaking grasses, I'm disrupting the ground. Kind of similar to what they've done in dog tests when they're using scent lock. A dog tracks the guy to where he is. That's a totally irrelevant, totally worthless track job, okay? Any dog can follow ground disruption. That's like me being able to follow a somebody to walk through a hay field in the morning, you know, through the morning dew. A dog can follow ground disruption and so can a deer. So this buck, he cut my trail and he actually was sniffing. He was trying to smell something. I don't know if he was trying to smell something human. I don't know what he was trying to smell, but he followed all the way damn near to my tree. Within probably five yards to my tree, he followed my exact route sniffing the brush, sniffing the ground, trying to find out what smell was associated with the ground disruption. And that's what the dog tests were. You know, some guy would wear scent lock and he'd walk out someplace and the dog would cut his trail and follow him. So they figured, well, the dog was following the person because the guy was leaving human odor on the weeds and vegetation. No, the man was making ground disruption. You could take a person that's totally in a plastic bag where there's absolutely no possible way for there to be any human odor whatsoever and his weight 150 pound 200 pound person whatever the weight of his feet touching the ground is going to disrupt vegetation and animals can smell that especially deer and dogs so those dog tests are 100 percent worthless i get sick of hearing about it and once in a while, during the course of the season, I'll have mature does or tonight a mature buck cut my trail and he was trying to smell something that was out of the ordinary, something out of place, and he did not. And he followed it all the way to my tree, probably took him five minutes, just slowly sniffing everything. And eventually, once he got close enough, he just turned around and walked over to a bush and started biting on some branches and then walked over to another tree and started rubbing it all. And I got videos of all this. This is all on video. So for you naysayers, you Kool-Aid drinkers out there that are following these other talk forums that poo-poo scent control, this is proof positive. There is absolutely no way on God's green earth that if this buck would have smelled any human odor on vegetation or on the ground that he would not have spooked and left. And I have this happen several times a year by mature deer. Typically they lose interest way before this guy did. You know, come from one direction, cut the trail, maybe come towards my tree five yards and then what, you know, and then just keep on going the way they were going. I, I really get sick of all this naysayer scent control. I know 
hundreds, hundreds of people now that pay no attention to wind. For the guys that have to pay attention to wind, I feel sorry for you. With the technology that's out there and you poo-poo it, you're not a very serious deer hunter. That's the end of that discussion, in my opinion, because to have that kind of technology available for you and the clothing doesn't cost any more, it's cost a third of the price of some of the higher end clothing that's, that's basically cult following clothing. And this actually has technology and it's half to a third the cost of some of this higher end stuff where you're paying 500, 500, 550 bucks for a jacket. I saw a Sitka jacket the other day and it was just a waterproof shell. There was nothing to this whatsoever. It was over $300. That should have cost 50 bucks. It's just a polyurethane membrane with a micro fleece exterior. That's all it was. It had a taffeta interior. That was all. And it was three, it was almost $350 just for a jacket. But it said Sitka on it. So a lot of people buy it because it says Sitka. Kind of like Yeti. Um, I'm not brand loyal to anybody. Sunlock has activated carbon. Makes a big difference. Afternoon. On some public land. Probably three eighths of a mile off of the main highway. You can see there's an old ladder stand from somebody. That's probably about 12 feet off the ground. I'm up about 30. Big can't tell Mars that runs back there about a half a mile. That's got a lot of dry spots in it.
If interested, the links to many of the podcasts I've been on or for information about my two-day whitetail workshops that take place in March and April, please visit my website at deer-john.net. Thank you for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and to receive notifications for future videos, please subscribe.